you know, basically since March to May, you know, Bitcoin top first, then Ethereum, they really haven't broken out again. Mm. So they've been this big kind of sloppy range that goes up and down a lot. And I've been thinking about that because normally at this point in the crypto cycle, you'd have seen mass retail participation and this explosive run. I was expecting it, as was many, it hasn't materialized. Why? Now, is there a structural change in the market? Or is it because crypto is discretionary spending or discretionary investment? And if you've raised prices on people, they have less money, retail participation, to put into crypto. Hmm. So, so maybe, maybe that's why the flow. So we've not seen the kind of number of new wallets and all of the other metrics follow when we had the recent high. And it makes me think that people don't have money to put in. And in the end, we're talking about inflation that's running at 6 7% a year. Mm. Well, Bitcoin's up 100% and Ethereum's up 500%. So it's more than accommodated. But people think it needs to be tick for tick correlated. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. What it is, is a long-term method for sidestepping the devaluation of fiat currency, along with, more importantly, a call option in the future of technology and Web3 and all of the new things that are being built. We're looking at it too short-term time horizon, mm. but maybe it's still this factor of discretionary spending. How much money can you put in? Can you put your $100 a month into your crypto portfolio? Mm. Or is that now going in the in your gas tank of your car mm. and on your grocery bill? Right? Yeah. That, that's a meaningful difference to people. And the same will affect equity markets. So are the Robin Hood traders able to deploy as much capital into opportunities? The answer is probably not. These, this generation of 30-something-year-olds, the millennials, got screwed over by the system. They have massive Absolutely. debts from education. Absolutely. They have no ability to buy property. Mm. They have no upside. They've got all-time record valuation in equity markets, real estate markets, bond markets. How are they supposed to make wealth? Right. So they are risk-takers by nature. They learn it in gaming. That's such an important point. Yeah, and so they come in a different mentality. Good up for them. They will learn the lessons of yeah. what's too much they're betting on their options. And, yeah. and, and you know, they've also learned that crowd behavior works as well, and they can corral a community around an idea and participate together. So I just think it's different. And people look at the amount of options trading and go, this is excess speculation. No, this is a whole different group of people who trade in a different way, much like when the systems funds and algos came into the market and was like, oh God, they're terrible. The world's going to blow up. No, they still exist. They just trade in a different way. So the reality is, is if you've debased the currency, your actual dollar is worth less in terms of stuff. So it, it looks less underfunded because assets have gone up. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is the purchasing power of those assets hasn't increased. So I think it's still a huge problem. I think the, um, the baby boom generation will diversify out of those assets. What I did not see was the Robin Hood traders. Ah. I knew it was coming to crypto yeah. and I said that in the first thing yeah. and this is the big opportunity and those guys have taken that. I didn't think they were going to use options as another way of participating in the market. So yes, it's, it's changing, yeah. but what I'm seeing is the millennials are taking risks in a way that is intelligent for them because right. they've got nothing to lose. Right. But Which they've got everything L Lily to gain. Frank has brought that up too. Why not go? And, and if you lose, you already are. You've already lost. You already and have nothing. But if you win, you're up 10x. And, and it's and, you, know. Uh, you know. I've mentioned this before. Is what really annoys me again is people tutting at the, these people saying that's not how you do things. These are the same people on yeah. Twitter who won't be held accountable for losses. Right. Well, on on Reddit, these people have got loss porn going on. They're like, God, look how much money I lost today. <laughs> So they're being honest about yeah. what they're doing. They understand the risk, but they're also enjoying it. YOLO is a real thing. Yeah. There is no correlation necessarily between crypto prices and Fed tightening. Mm -hmm. So we haven't seen that. Okay. And institutions move slowly. Mm. So it's taken them two years to get the approval to trade. And mm -hmm. you know, I've spoken to a number of people here, whether it's you know Fireblocks or whether it's the guys at Luca, talking about all they're doing is onboarding these people and mm -hmm. it takes them a year to get their their investment committee approvals and then they need to set up their back office infrastructure and do all of this so what they're thinking of is a long-term allocation they're not traders these institutions yeah. they're thinking okay we want to put 
2% of our portfolio in crypto and we have to start somewhere. And usually they all act like sheep because they start at the beginning of the year. So the investment committee <laughs> says, still in, fine, from next year's budget, of course it is. And then they operate quarterly yeah. and they rebalance. And that does change the structure of markets. Because if crypto has gone up a lot or gone down, if it's gone up a lot, they'll sell some to reduce the exposure back to where they want it to be, their 2%. Mm. But if it's fallen, they'll buy it. So it does dampen volatility over time and yeah. change the structure of markets. I think it's a good thing. Some people are traders. They're mm -hmm. short term, they want to buy and sell. I don't think that's the right thing to do in exponential trends. Mm -hmm. They're volatile by nature. And what you're, all you're looking for is what is the network adoption? Are people joining the network? Are people building on top of it? That's all that matters because price will follow. So trying to figure out you know, where the price is going to be at any one point in time. And I, I wrote a tweet thread about this. It's like there are no gurus. Nobody yeah. knows. Everyone's just trying to figure it out best we can based on the experience that we have. And the market will go where it goes. But the hypothesis, that's the thing you need to test. And the hypothesis is not, does Bitcoin go down to 40K? Does it go up to, does it end the year here? It's not that. The hypothesis is, if we're right, this whole Web3 revolution means there is a mass adoption of this space. Is that happening? Mm -hmm. And by all accounts, all we're seeing is continued adoption. But what is going on is we're building the third version of the internet mm. of which we can participate and own parts of it. So the difference I've explained before is if you think of Facebook, it's one of the biggest networks on earth. We got the benefit of using the network and connecting with our friends and family and the shareholders got rich because of network effects, Metcalfe's law. Because they owned it. Because they owned it. Now, we used it, this and new, we were the commodity in, in and many cases. And what it cases. did, it concentrated the power into Facebook, Google, and these others. This new part is a decentralization of that entire structure. We're pulling apart that structure and rebuilding it by giving the network participants ownership of the network too. So that creates massive behavioral incentives for this to work, because suddenly you want this to work because the value of the network is going to go up and because you own a part of the network, the token, you're going to make money from it. That's incredibly powerful. You give humans an incentive like that, mm. it will explode. It's unstoppable because of that. And it also gets rid of or disrupts some of the existing problems of these massive corporations having control over the internet. What we see, what we read, how we operate, in so much so that they affect our behavior to serve ads to us, create anger, create fear, yeah. and And we've, we've, we, if we haven't seen that in this past year, I mean. Yeah, and also, you know, I, I find it amazing that people worry about government and giving over our information to governments and stuff. When we've basically given everything to Google and Facebook. Yeah. Everything we do, everywhere we've ever gone, what time we get out of bed, what time we check our phones, who we're with, they know every single part. Mm -hmm. Even those nest cams in your house, the, the nest creepy, in yeah. your house knows when you're on holiday, yep. when you're back, what time you wake up, what room you're in. Well, you know because in. the ad pops up five seconds after you talked about something with, with and, apparently and nothing on. So why does Google own nest? Yeah. Because when you come into your house, what do you do? You put your phone down. So now it knows where you are in your house at any one point. Things that your big, phone yeah, is exactly. not giving you the information of because your phone stops moving, but the house now tells you where you are. I mean, this is incredible.